Hi there, Jason here with PurpleSec, and today we're talking about vulnerability detection and visibility. More specifically, we'll be discussing techniques, best practices, and tools organizations can use to improve visibility into their entire attack surface. Today, we're joined by Clement Fourcroix, that I, hopefully I said that right, uh, who is currently the vulnerability, vulnerability management lead at Elastic, and he's live with us from France. Clement, thank you so much for being here today. Hello, and uh, thank you for hosting me in your uh, podcast. Excellent. Um, so before we dive into the heart of the conversation here, um, can you tell our audience a little bit about yourself and your journey into the field of cybersecurity? So uh, before working in the cybersecurity, I was working uh, on SharePoint. I know no one is perfect, um, but it allows me to understand the, like, the Microsoft world. And five years ago, um, I moved to cybersecurity. And there I did like most of the people, like incident response, a bit of red teaming. And since uh, three years, I'm uh, taking care about the vulnerability management program at Elastic. That's awesome. So you have the red team experience, you understand how the attackers are working, and then you took that knowledge and experience and, and, and putting it into application today. Yeah. Awesome. So um, real quick, can you briefly explain the importance of visibility and vulnerability management and how it impacts organizations' uh, security posture? Yeah. Um, so I guess most of you know the, the sentence, uh, you can secure what you don't know. And uh, I guess it's it's uh, really true. And um, if if people were working in the security industry uh, during uh, Log4j, they know the importance of, uh, get, of having visibility. And it's extremely hard to secure what you don't know, um, especially in those kind of moments where you have to know. Um, so yeah, visibility is, uh, is the, the first element uh, that you need to focus on when you deal with vulnerability management. Yeah, Log4j was definitely a nightmare. Um, <laughs> so that's yeah. putting it lightly. Um, and and you know, yeah, you, you bring a really good point. You don't you you can't secure what you don't know. And I think in a previous interview, we were talking with uh, Joshua Copeland. And he was saying that uh, vulnerabilities go undetected for seven months on average. That's insane. So shifting gears here, looking at understanding poor visibility, you know, let's get at the heart of the matter. Why is poor visibility such a major issue in vulnerability management? I think it's, uh, first of all, because of the limited resources uh, in terms of uh, technology and in terms also of, uh, of uh, people. Um, and uh, also, like most of the time, people know pretty well their uh, internal uh, network uh, environment. But there are some areas uh, where it's much more difficult uh, to get visibility, like the external attack, uh, like the external uh, facing application, um, the containers part where it's pretty new and uh, the security teams might have challenge to implement uh, the, the scanning and, and visibility. So it's DNS management also is, is like uh, pretty hard because you create a website on an application, then this application is might be decommissioned, you don't know. Um, so all those, uh, those elements make the life of security teams quite hard to be uh, to have like a good understanding about the 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 perimeter their perimeter and all the assets in their environment. Yeah, it's it's unfortunate and that it's the way of the world. We we hear that often on our end where it's like we recommend a uh, a remediation factor for um, some vulnerability we found, and the client turns around and says, "Well, is there anything else we can do?" It's like, "No, this is the fix." It's like, "Well, we can't do that because our team says it's too complex and too expensive." Okay, well, that's you're accepting that risk. So, what are then are some common blind spots or areas that are frequently overlooked when people are conducting these vulnerability assessments? Um, it's usually what is not really well managed. 
Um, so like, for example, the, your instances, uh, either in cloud or um, on-prem, usually it's very well managed and you have like some uh, shortcuts you can leverage uh, to get some inventory. Like, uh, for example, yeah, in the Microsoft world, uh, you have the Active Directory where, where you can extract a lot of information. But there are some areas where it's it might be a bit easier to get the inventory, but it's difficult to uh, to fix, to know the owner of the asset. Um, and I think, yeah, it, it's it's more the management rather than the the discovery of the of the of the different assets in your environment. So how things are set up in the back end? Like Oh, uh, yeah, but for example, for DNS, you, you create, uh, I don't know, a website uh, and the team uh, decides to decommission this website and but the, the DNS records remains. As a security team, it's quite hard to know which team was handling uh, or created this, uh, this uh, DNS and then get the approval to remove the DNS. Um, those kind of, of stuff are pretty hard. So this is why like bug bounty program are pretty interesting uh, because you will have security researchers doing those research for you and they will show you how it could be attacked attack, attacked, and not that potentially it could be attacked. Mm -hmm. So bug bounty is pretty good uh, for that. And of course, yeah, having an asset inventory uh, is, uh, is super important uh, and with clouds, it's much easier now to build those asset inventories, but it's still you need you need to identify the owner behind. So yeah, that that's one of the most common themes that I hear. Um, you know, I've been interviewing a, a few folks um, on this topic, and the asset inventory and management has it's like the biggest pain point it seems. Um, and I'm going to be talking with someone soon about that and see how we can uh, focus on it. But do do you have any um thoughts on on how organizations can improve um building out their asset inventories i think the the different the security teams should they will probably they are probably the one that really needs it and most of the time there is like some responsibility like is it another team responsibility or the is it the security team mm. i'm like Okay, just start, build something. It's not perfect. It's okay. Maybe uh, it will cover 10% of the of your assets. Okay, but then you will have another IDs, and then maybe it will uh, cover 30%. So start small. Even even if it's like manual at the beginning. For example, at Elastic at the beginning, I had like a manual uh, inventory where I knew that this team was managing this cloud account. And I was managing this uh, manually. And then there was an initiative uh, at the company level where it came uh, from finance, where they say that we are spending uh, some money and they want uh, us to control uh, our cloud spending. And we had a tag initi initiative that started and it really helped me. So then I jumped into the project and I tried to uh, get the information that I, that I needed. So, find allies in the in the company usually finance people are really <laughs> good to help you uh, especially if you have the same goal uh, and start small start small interesting so working with your departments instead of uh, butting heads <laughs> and yeah yeah and then yeah finding common goals are really important between both teams so that you can you know share goals people are going to work towards those objectives and then man i like the way you think because it's like taking big chunks these insurmountable tasks or these goals or objectives and then breaking them into individual tasks and then you know not looking at it as this big complex monster that i have to deal with it and you know to your point doing something is better than nothing so that's very well put. Yeah. Um, one, last, one last question that I have here on understanding uh, visibility. How does an organization know if they have poor visibility? Like what are some of the, the signals? If, you're, if you don't already know the vulnerabilities are out there and you're not scanning for them, how do you know that you have a problem? As you say, it's, uh, usually you hear it when you have problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, so then you need to uh, to learn 
from you know, from those issues. And like, let's say you have an incident on, on an asset that you didn't know, then you need to learn and say, okay, why I didn't know that, and how what can I do uh, to discover those assets? Maybe you will uh, you will not find like an easy solution or the the effort will be too high, but at least you know that you don't know. And mm -hmm. um, so I think a yeah, learning from problem is one scanning externally. Uh, for example, you have some uh, external, some security rating companies where you can monitor your score uh, online and, uh, and they do a scanning for you. Um, so it might also be interesting to get some information. Um, your DNS definitely uh, is, a, is a really interesting uh, source. And then you, you have to think about some ways uh, uh, like, yeah, in Microsoft World, most of the uh, re assets are within the uh, Active Directory. Um, but if you have, if you are a cloud company, like uh, we, we are at Elastic, uh, you have like some, uh, some identity providers that can help you, maybe the logs, maybe, yeah, partner with other teams uh, and yeah, it will help you. Uh, to discover new assets. Mm -hmm. And is, is that something that is attainable for an SMB? You, you mentioned like the Microsoft stack, and I know they have like the, their E3 programs and everything that are quite affordable. Is is that something that, you know, an enterprise, yeah, they'll, they'll be able to put teams and resources behind it, but are there um, ways that smaller organizations can maybe bootstrap this a little bit for themselves? The, the advantage of small organization is that their scope is much, much smaller. So I, I would say that I think it's it's easier in small organization, even if they have limited mm. resources. I believe it's smaller than in big organization where you have like people all around the world and you are not aware about all the initiatives. Then if you are a pure cloud company, they ha they, they, they are some shortcuts. So for example, uh, the cloud uh, providers, they all have APIs. So either through your vulnerability management solution like Quali, Quali Stenable, uh, at least it's the one, that, the one that I know, they have mm -hmm. some Qualys connectors that you can set up and that will monitor your cloud account um, for you. Like Qualys, it's every four hours, they will run, uh, they will request the API, give me all the, uh, uh, database, all the instance, all the load balancers, and then it will go into the tool, into Qualys. And uh, for example, at Elastic, this is how we are measuring our coverage. We are um, doing a diff between the total number of instance uh, discovered uh, through this connector. And, the, and it's a percentage where we have the Qualys agents divided by the total number of, uh, of assets. <clears throat> Okay, interesting. So if you're a pure cloud company, that you have an avenue for that. Um, all right, so let, let's let's talk a little bit about techniques for improving visibility. Um, so from your experience, what are some techniques for identifying and tracking all of the assets in an organization's network? I know we touched on on this a little bit earlier. You you need to basically you need to think because. You need to think where the data is. Um, you need to be curious, and so this is more the mindset that you need to have. Then, yeah, there are some solutions that exist, like in the cloud. I just um, I just explained uh, the the connectors. I think there are some open source solution. I have one in mind that I never tested, but I heard it's pretty good. It's called Cartography, um, which is um, yeah, basically it scan your network or Sorry, you know, it, it requests the, um, it, may, it makes some calls to the API, to the cloud providers, and then it's consolidating everything uh, we, um, within a, a database. And then you can query, group, see the relation between the, the, different, uh, the different assets. I'm sorry, what was the name um, of that tool? I think it's Cartography. I need to check the name. Uh, I think it was done by, I will I will find it. Uh, okay. It yeah, we can. Be... We'll add a, a link in the description to that for anyone that wants to check it out. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And it's cart oh, go ahead. cartography made by Lyft. 
Awesome. We'll make that link available. And so how can then you how can then you ensure that all endpoints, um, including remote and BYOD devices, are included in, in your scanning activity? This one is challenging. <laughs> 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 because yeah, endpoint is probably the the area where it's it's the the hardest because instant um, endpoints are going up and down you they are in different time zone so it's it's pretty hard so if your uh, it has uh, some processes usually they have uh, they, they keep track of the assets because they want to know which uh, asset is uh, used by which uh, person um so yeah, usually rely on IT for this part. Um, then yeah, if you have a bring your own device, it's it's even harder. Um, there are some uh, yeah, the, the logs uh, from your SIM also might help. So if you see some some connections for specific users, uh, you you might be able to uh, extract some information. Uh, but it's probably tedious to to build your asset inventory based on that mm -hmm. um, and then there are some initiatives that are uh, super interesting um, it's called island it's a managed border um, i think the one from google is called beyond corp and the interesting part is that you can use your own device but you connect to uh, your um, uh, website to your application you need to to use this specific border, and this uh, browser is managed uh, by the company. And by doing that, you will be able to extract from the log, uh, or from maybe they have an asset inventory. You will be able to get the list of all uh, the assets and all the users uh, that are um, connecting through this uh, managed border. So, yeah, it's no magic, but you have to. To think. <laughs> Very interesting. And how long have those uh, secure browsers been around for? I don't know. Um, Island, I know it's pretty new. Like, yeah, really new. Beyond Cop, I think it's pretty recent also, like probably a few, few years, if not like, yeah, two to three years, I believe. Uh, and I, I think they will be more and more used because you can more control the flow. Um, like people connecting to your environment, uh, and mm -hmm. it's much easier, I guess, to secure a border than secure the entire operating system. <laughs> Sounds like it. Awesome. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how that evolves. It's always good to see um, new technologies and solutions being adopted, and then you know you hear about it five years ago, and then today it's like clouds everywhere or, <laughs> or something like yeah. that. Um, this topic is, uh, or this next question is a more networking um, oriented. I know you're you're more focused on cloud security, but it's something that always gets brought up, um, and it's the role of network segmentation. And in in, in your view, it, does implementing network segmentation help you to improve visibility? I'm not sure it will help for the visibility part. I mean, it is because you, you will have a, a smaller, uh, or if you, for example, if you run a scan, a discovery scan to see all the assets, it's much easier to uh, run multiple ones in different uh, network segments than running one scan in the whole uh, big uh, corporate network. Um, so it also means that if you have like a segmented network that it's more managed, uh where when you have like just one uh corporate flat network it means that it's less well managed so probably yeah, it's i mean it's not because you have network segmentation that you have better uh, visibility but you cannot have network segmentation without visibility so it's mm. yeah, at the end you will it will be better for the visibility part so it's it's because it's forcing you to build out yeah. those segments. It's forcing you to build out those asset inventories and everything that we were talking about earlier. Mm, makes a lot of sense. Um, nine times out of ten, I always get uh, it's too complex or too expensive. I'm like, okay, that's good for you then. Um, <laughs> 
let's talk about third party vendors this and, and suppliers this one um caught a lot of attention in the mainstream i would say with solar winds was probably one of the bigger names shortly afterwards kaseya was another big name um and you know i think a lot of organizations have started to pay more attention to their supply chain um, with their vendors so how can you ensure that your third party vendors and suppliers are included um, in your vulnerability management activities? Um, I have like a strong opinion on, on this one. Like there is nothing you can do in the sense that, um, for example, LastPass, they had a breach uh, and but they had some like uh, certification. And what is public is only certification or what the company is telling you when you are signing the contract. But you cannot like go inside the company to, to know what's really, really what's going on. So mm. I think it's good for just the visibility part and be prepared. But I don't have big hopes that it will change, that you can prevent anything by doing that. Mm -hmm. It's. It's a struggle, especially when you've got really small shops, um, and I'm talking like less than 10 employees, being the entry point into compromising a government agency. <laughs> like, what do you do about that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, but maybe the uh, the initial, I mean, yeah, the initial connection needs to be, or the the link between the two entity might be reduced to the minimum in order to like protect both uh, both companies or government. Uh, you need to reduce it to the strict minimum, and you need to ask question about uh, to yourself like, do I really need to send this data or retrieve this data? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because if you if you don't do that, you might go to the uh, quickest solution, and then uh, it might be harder to to manage. Yeah, interesting. It comes down to employee awareness. What 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 should I and shouldn't I send? Always comes down to that. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the role of penetration testing and how it, what role it plays in increasing visibility and identifying vulnerabilities um, that may be missed in in your scanning. Um, in pen. From what I know, in pen test, it's much more targeted. So let's let's say we'll uh, test one application. But if we speak about red teaming, I think it's super interesting um, because uh, the attacker they will use uh, they will use the shortest path uh, and the easiest path, and it's usually what you, what you will not expect, and they will discover stuff that are uh, like really low hanging fruits and you didn't think of. So. I think they are really, really interesting. Um, it will also uh, help you to sell uh, some ideas or some project to your management because you will be able to say, OK, this is what uh, the red team was able to do. We detected at this point or not. <laughs> and now this is our recommendation and what we, would, uh, we want to do. And yeah, red teaming, it's a uh, I really like it because it usually help uh, all the teams and the management to understand the, the issue, uh, even if you might already know, but it will help you to sell it to the to the management. Yeah, it's um, it's unfortunate that red teaming isn't more accessible for organizations, um, but you know, not everyone needs it. It is valuable though. But th there are some like like a security rating platform, for example. They are okay. interesting because they will do the discovery for you. They will do the basic testing. And at the end, like most of the like companies, they will not be attacked by an APT. They mm -hmm. will be attacked because they have an RDP with a low password uh, that is directly connected to their environment. So, and this is what you want to avoid. And those uh, those tools, they will be able to uh, to discover it for you. So it's not real red teaming. But it's uh, it's more manageable and more affordable to have those kind of, uh, of solutions. You're bringing in some automation into the mix, reducing the manual lift. All right, yeah. makes sense. That's uh, we we like automation here at PurpleSec. Um, <laughs> we we don't want people <laughs> like yourself who know what they're doing and have more valuable things to do with their time than 
pushing a button or prioritizing vulnerabilities. So yeah. you talked about tools, which is a fantastic segue um, for this next topic that I want to discuss, and that's really the tools for improving detection and visibility. Um, so in your experience, what are some effective vulnerability scanning tools that our organizations can use? Um, I, I'm not sure the issue with vulnerability management is the scanning part. Mm. Of course, there are some challenges, uh, but there are challenges that we can manage. Uh, I believe the, 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 yeah, the challenge, it's more like visibility as we, we are discussing, prioritization and patching. <laughs> <laughs> What is it about patching um, out of curiosity that you think is an issue? Um, I think it's it's just because the the like most of the team there is no value direct value in patching. So the different teams that they want to work on projects, uh, they want to improve things, they want to develop some new products. Like let's say it patching, it's boring, it's hard. You need to uh, most of the time coordinate with the different teams, maybe coordinate uh, with the customer uh, to have some agreed time frame. So patching is, it's hard to manage, not to do, mm. but to manage. Um, so I think this is why people have difficulties to patch. But I th since a few, a few years, I see more and more um, effort from like the tools, uh, Okay, at Elastic we are using Qualys, so uh, but we and we build our own vulnerability management solution on, on top of Elastic. I mean the reporting part, and I think that KPIs uh, really help uh, tracking, um, showing like a bit the difference between the different teams. Those kind of uh, of, uh, of of stuff really help uh, to show the management where they need uh, where we need to to put our effort, mm -hmm. and um, yeah. So it was really bad, but I think more and more people understand the the importance of patching, and it's it's getting better. So you made a really good point there. Are you talking, if I understand correctly, you're talking about at a business unit level. So like finance department, where are their vulnerabilities at? Marketing department, where are their vulnerabilities at? And so I think that's that's the conversation where you, you can take that and say, hey, CISO or CSO or whoever's in charge of your security, this business unit is lacking because of whatever the factors are. Could be a number of things. Um, we need to focus more attention on, on this, and this is going to have X percent reduction in, in risk rating or something like that. Yeah, exactly. It's uh, you need to, you need to help uh, the different teams because, like we, I mean, before I was a system administrator, so I know what it is <laughs> to receive like an Excel file with like thousand or even like <laughs> million of vulnerabilities. Like, can you just you look at this be, real quick? <laughs> yeah, you need to be really motivated to uh, to to work with an Excel, uh, and also most of the time, like you don't necess necessarily know all your servers. Um, so it's it's super hard. And I think it really helped me because I was like, okay, what can I, do? if I was in this position again, what I would like to receive from the different teams mm. and, um, and be able to scope the vulnerabilities to the different teams and to say to the different teams, okay, please next month focus on those three vulnerability it's much more manageable for the for the for the different teams and they are more willing uh, to uh, to patch and this is my personal objective but then my goal is to be able to say like okay your score is uh, i don't know 5 today if you patch tomorrow it will be uh, 6 or 7 considering mm. that 10 is good <laughs> So, so you're giving someone like an achievable objective, like, oh, I want to get a 10 out of 10. I, I want that score. Yeah. And mm -hmm. and comparing team also uh, definitely help because people don't want to be at the bottom. Uh, so yeah, it helps. It's true. It's true. Um, I want to get uh, back to scanning real quickly. I know you mentioned it's not as big of a, a factor, but it, you know, if you're not doing the first step right, then everything could fall apart. So how do you ensure that your scanning tools are configured correctly 
and that they're effectively detecting all of the vulnerabilities? I mean, maybe not all. <laughs> yeah, if you're in cloud, it's I would not say that it's easy, but it's much more uh, easier than if you have an on-prem environment. Um, because in cloud you rely on the API and like if you call if you go to AWS API and say like give me all uh, the instances you will have all the instances. On premise is different because you will probably scan uh, based on network uh, IP addresses and you might have like uh, some uh, routers some proxies some instances uh, so it's much more difficult to know what's behind what you're scanning uh un unless it's really well segmented so in cloud it's pretty easy in on-prem it's it's a nightmare <laughs> to <sum up. laughs> move, move everything to the cloud everything uh, yeah. <laughs> maybe not everything um okay great uh so then taking a look at threat intelligence you know, how can that be leveraged to identify potential vulnerabilities and attack vectors before they're exploited so uh, the, the good uh, thing is that now, uh, okay, before we were all the, all using a CVSS score and the problem is like we have like uh, probably, I guess like 60% of our vulnerabilities that are scored high or even critical. Um, <laughs> so it's, if everything is a priority, nothing is a priority. So it, then it's difficult to uh, to know which one we should focus on. And the good the good part is that now uh, we can leverage first EPSS. I think it's Enhanced Prediction Scoring System. It's made by First, and I think they just released uh, their their version three uh, this month. And for each vulnerability in uh, NVD, they will give you a score, a percentage of the vulnerability being exploited in the next 30 days. So the interesting part is that then you can leverage this uh, this information to focus on the top three uh, vulnerability every month, or top five, or top ten, or top ten, whatever. And this is the first part to prioritize. And then, of course, you need to uh, link it with the uh, with the context within your environment. If you have a public-facing application, it's most likely to be exploited than uh, an internal one. Um, so yeah, first EPSS is a really good one. And also you can leverage RSS feeds. Uh, it's like social media, like Twitter or LinkedIn. It's it's super interesting to know uh, the news that are, uh, the vulnerabilities that are hitting the news. Um, because usually those are the most, uh, the, ris the most risky ones, so yeah. Yeah, it's hard to keep up with all of them. Um, I think there was like some 20,000 new vulnerabilities that came out last year. My stats are a little rusty on that. But of those, a smaller percentage were actually exploitable. So that's where it comes in. That's where you bring in your efficiencies into your, your program. It's like, do I really need to focus on this critical because it says it's critical? Well, no, because I've got this compensated control in place. I don't need to worry about that. Yeah. And just to add regarding the prioritization, it's also a challenge because if you have some certification like PCI and SOC2, you have, I don't remember in detail, but I think uh, for, uh, for, for both, you need to patch all your critical vulnerability uh, within uh, 30 days. Mm -hmm. So it's like zero or one, but there is like no, uh, no in the middle. So I need to do that but you can have those requirements for your production environment where uh, it is required but for all the rest you might focus on the prioritization only and so this is why you need to like really know your environment and you need to adapt and there is no like one size fits all uh, policy you need to to agree uh, speak with the different teams and yeah take the prioritization to your advantage. Those are really good points. Um, so let's talk now about some some best practices. Let's get into the, some actionable information here, something that uh, our audience can take with them and, and maybe apply on their own, right? Um, 
so how can organizations create a, visib a visibility strategy that is effective and actionable? Meaning I, I did my scanning and everything and I'm actually able to, to patch the things that are worth patching. I think it's the, you need to start measuring it. If you don't measure it, it's super difficult to, uh, to show it then uh, to the management and to say like, we have an issue. If you have a number, it's much better. I agree that it might be difficult to build it uh, because uh, for example, the, the, what I was explaining with the cloud connectors, of course, you will only have visibility on the cloud connectors where you have implemented the connectors on the cloud account, sorry, where you have implemented uh, the connector. Uh, but the, you might have other accounts where you're not tracking anything on those. So then you need to think uh, and maybe have some processes like uh, some quarterly or monthly or yearly review where you will like try to extract the list of all your cloud accounts and then check uh, where uh, it's uh, where you have the connector configured uh, or not. So it's it's a moving thing and usually with the time things get better you have better understanding you have better you have more people informing you you have more people um going into the into the process the standard uh process um so yeah measure it and have some process in place to to review what you what you have on a regular basis makes sense you so you said measuring and you you mentioned kpis um, just to, to add on to that a little bit, what are some of the core KPIs that you look for when you're trying to measure the success of a program? You mean for the visibility part or the... Or uh, the for, for the visibility part, for the visibility okay. part, yeah. Yeah, coverage, um, I would say coverage, uh, where, for example, for an instance, do you have uh, the cloud engine installed or do you have, uh, is it scanned? compared to the total number of assets, but you will have also to split it by technology. So you will have it, for instance, uh, for containers, for web application, for uh, databases potentially, for like, yeah, whatever. Um, but it, I think it's important that you split, split it by technology. Mm -hmm. All right. Asset type. <laughs> And then uh, what are the key factors to consider when you're designing a vulnerability management program that prioritizes visibility? Like if you were to build something from the ground up in the ideal state, what are, what are some things that you would really want to focus on? My, yeah, my priority would be uh, uh, building a metric uh, for the, the uh, coverage. Um, and because without that, it's difficult to speak with other teams. Um, so this is, yeah, this, this is a target and how do you achieve, achieve that is by building some, uh, some automation. Um, for example, at Elastic, what we did is we started with, uh, building the, the coverage metric. And then as I had all the data in place, what I, what I did is I created some automation to automatically create issues to the different, to the different teams where uh, the cloud agent uh, was missing. So like if it's a dev environment, uh, you have some time. If it's a production environment, you have a shorter time. And automatically the ticket is created. Um, and this really helped uh, to improve the coverage. Automation, it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's the way of the future for things, it seems, um, for, yeah. for a lot of, uh, on both sides, the red teaming and the, and the blue teaming. Um, and, and do you have any practical tips for other vulnerability management professionals who might be struggling to get proper visibility into uh, their environments? Yeah, probably uh, the, the only advice that I will give is start small. <laughs> like we always want the, the big thing but we will never have it because we will all the time uh, add, uh, like I have I always think about like, we are starting a race, but we are all the time moving uh, the arrival, the, the arrival. And so it's the same, like you need to go step by step and, uh, and maybe you will, uh, yeah, at the beginning you will uh, focus on uh, just your, uh, 
cloud instances. Then maybe you will move to a web application and, or maybe at the beginning we'll focus on like I'm working really well with this team. So I will start to work with them to build the process when it will be working quite well with this team, then I will extend it to another team. And um, so yeah, every, every month, every quarter, you need to do more small progress. And at the end, you will see that it will, uh, it will work. Fantastic. Awesome. And for any security enthusiast who might be watching this, or maybe someone who just uh, uh, is in school or diving into vulnerability management as a profession, what advice would you give to that individual who, who really wants to start out their career in, in this path? Usually it's not uh, people that are starting a career uh, in uh, cybersecurity. They are not willing to go into the vulnerability management space. And I understand. <laughs> um, what I really like in this area is like you have uh, like the competition is it's much lower and no one scares or no one likes vulnerability management. So the, the expectation are pretty low. So as long as you do something that is a bit like that is better than uh, than before, people are happy about you. So if you, yeah, it's, it's probably one of the easiest area uh, to start in the vulnerability, to start in the cybersecurity. So if you want to get started in your career, you want to get exposure, maybe you want to be an elite pen tester one day, but you're not quite there. Um, vulnerability management gets you a lot of good exposure to get, get you started. All right. Awesome. Well, Clement, I, I want to thank you so much for your time. This has been really enlightening for me. I learn so much when I talk to, to experts like yourself on these topics more than any course or any book. I hope people that are watching uh, feel the similar way. Um, before we uh, wrap up here, do you have any closing thoughts? I want to thank the security community because I learned a lot uh, from people that are sharing what they do uh, or the way they think. And uh, I think it's really, really important. And if I, if uh, now I can give a bit about what I learned, I'm super happy. So yeah, just continue to share, continue to learn and it will be good. That's awesome. I love that. Well, thank you again, Clement. I appreciate your time. This was a great conversation. Thank you, uh, Jason, for having me uh, here.